Hello, this video is going to be an introduction to thermodynamics covering heat and the first law of thermodynamics. So first, what is heat? Well, we write heat here in equations with the variable Q, and it is measured in units of joules. And then what heat is, is uh, it describes the energy that is exchanged between a system and its surroundings due to the difference in temperature between the system and surroundings. And so it's not the change, differences in temperature within a system, but this difference in temperature between a system and its surrounding that causes energy to flow either from the surroundings into the system or vice versa. Um, and that energy transfer due to a difference in temperature is what we define as heat. So the energy that's transferred due to a difference in temperature. Now this is different from work because work is energy that is transferred as a result of force being applied um, in a direction that is parallel to the force or the dot product between force and distance. So this doesn't have to do with work. This is a completely different method of uh, energy transfer. Um, now, the methods of um, heating include conduction, convection, and radiation, and we'll mainly focus on conduction. So for conduction, we want to analyze the rate at which heat is transferred. So uh, we want to have an equation for uh, Q over delta T. So this is the rate at which heat transfer occurs. Now consider you have two reservoirs of temperature here, one at T1 and then one is T2. And now we know, let's say T1 is at a greater temperature than T2. We know that if it's at a greater temperature, uh, the direction of heat should be from T1 into T2 to reach thermal equilibrium. Now, in order to allow conduction to occur, let's put a material here um, that we'll draw here. This is a 3D slab of some material. Now the shape of the cross section of this material doesn't really matter. It could be like this square or it could be a cylinder. Um, but what we care about now is first the length of this material, which we call L. And we also care about the cross sectional area here. So this cross sectional area A. And then one more thing we need to know is uh, a property of the material uh, K, which is the thermal conductivity. So K here is thermal conductivity. And that is measured in uh, units of watts per meter Kelvin. And this is how well the material itself conducts heat. And once we know these, we can um, define our equation for the rate of heat transfer. So given a larger cross-sectional area, um, we know that it goes this way, the heat transfer is in this direction. Given a large cross-sectional area, more heat will be able to transfer. So the rate of heat transfer will be faster, which means that it's directly proportional to area here. So we have rate of heat transfer is proportional to area. And then given a higher thermal conductivity, you know that the rate of heat transfer should also be higher if the thermal conductivity of a material increases. So the rate of heat transfer here is directly proportional to K. And then finally, a difference in temperature is important. So we know the difference in temperature between these two sides is uh, equal to T1 minus T2. And so if there's a greater temperature difference, then there should be a faster transfer of heat. So the rate of heat transfer is also directly proportional to the difference in temperature. So we have this, but then we know rate of heat transfer is inversely proportional to the length because the longer this connecting material is, the slower that heat transfer will occur. So the rate of heat transfer should be inversely proportional to the length of this material. So from that, we get this equation. So Q over delta T is equal to K, the thermal conductivity, times A, the cross-sectional area, times 
delta t. In this case, this is capital T, which is difference in temperature, divided by L, which is the length of this conducting material. And so this is the equation that we can use to find the rate of heat transfer um, given this, the properties of this conducting material in between. So let's look at a problem with this, um, applying this concept. So let's say we have um, a material, or we have two different uh, slabs of material here. And so they have different lengths and different thermal conductivities, but they have the same cross-sectional area. And we put them end to end. So we have, let's say, a green material here. And then this has length L1, and then it has thermal conductivity K1. And then we also have this yellow material, same cross-sectional area, we put it end to end. And then this has length L2 and thermal conductivity K2. Now these uh, lengths do not have to be equal and the thermal conductivities can be different. Um, but we're putting them end to end here, and they have the same area. And now let's say one side of it has T1, and the other side of it is at T2, where T1 is greater than T2. Um, and we want to know, what is the uh, rate of heat transfer from this end of T1 end to the T2 end? Now, since uh, conservation of energy, we know that the uh, heat transfer at the T1 end has to be equal to the heat transfer at the T2 end. So we know that here the rate of heat transfer here over delta T is equal to K1 times the area times uh, the difference in temperature, which ends in between here. So let's call this Tx, which is the temperature in the middle between um, at the junction of these two materials. So the difference in temperature here is T1 minus Tx, and then divided by L1. So that's the rate of heat transfer at inside material 1. And this is going to be equal, because of conservation of energy, to the rate of heat transfer in material 2. So this is equal to K2 times area, which is the same again, times uh, Tx minus T2 this time, because this is the difference in temperature between the sides of K2 over L2. Now looking at this equation, um, we can figure out that in order for this, uh, the rates of heat um, to be the same in both materials, we'll need a greater temperature difference in the one that has less thermal conductivity. So this Tx here doesn't necessarily need to be the midpoint of T1 and T2. It depends on the thermal conductivities and lengths of these two materials. So since we don't need to know Tx when we are um, when we're solving for this rate of heat transfer, we can solve these equations for Tx and then plug in to get our rate of heat transfer. So to do this, uh, we look and then we see that areas on both sides of these, so it cancels out. So we have K1 T1 minus K1 Tx over L1 is equal to K2 Tx minus K2 T2 over L2. Now, if we get rid of this denominator here, um, or actually, we can just uh, move the Tx to one side and then move the uh, parts of the fraction without Tx to the other side. So we have K2 Tx over L2 uh, plus K1 Tx over L1 is equal to K1 T over L1 plus K2 T2. So this is K1 T1 over L1. Sorry, this should be a K1 T1 um, over L2. Now we can multiply both sides of this by L1 L2 to get a common denominator here. Um, or so we we multiply we get a, we can get a common denominator here or remove this denominator. So we have if we multiply both sides of this by l one l two we get uh, 
L1 K2 TX plus L2 K1 TX is equal to L2 K1 T1 plus L1 K2 T2. And then we can factor out the TX and divide. So we have TX is equal to L2 K1 T1 plus L1 K2 T2 over this part that we factored out, which is L1 K2 plus L2 K1. Now that we have Tx, we can plug this back into one of our equations up here and then solve for uh, Q over delta T. So we know that Q over delta T is equal to K1 A, uh, and this is T1 minus Tx here. So this is T1 minus L2 K1 T1 plus L2 K2 T2 over L1 K2 plus L2 K1, and then divided by L1. So that comes from up here. And then simplifying this, uh, we can multiply this out to get Okay, so simplifying this, first of all, let me see, I actually wrote L2 here. This should be L1. Um, we can uh, write, rewrite this as K1A over L1 times, and then we want a common denominator here, so T1 times L1 K2 plus T1, um, yeah, T1 L2 K1 k1 minus the numerator of this fraction here so minus well i'll rewrite the terms here so t1 uh, l2 k1 minus uh, t2 l1 k2 and then all over l1 k2 plus l2 k1 now notice that these two terms here are exactly the same, so they cancel out. And then we can also um, notice that this L1 in the denominator cancels out with the L1 terms in the numerator on top here. And we can factor out a K2. So this leaves us with, this is equal to um, here, K1, K2, A times T1 uh, minus T2 divided by L1 K2 plus L2 K1. And then if we divide um, both the numerator and denominator of this by uh, K1 K2, so if we divide both of these by K1 K2, so divided by K1 K2 over a1 k2 so this is basically dividing by one and it's not changing anything we get that um, the heat flow or rate of heat transfer is equal to the area times t1 minus t2 which is the difference in temperature here so notice this is difference in temperature uh, divided by l1 uh, l1 over k1 plus L2 over K2. So this is the final equation we get. So notice that in this system right here, our rate of heat transfer is equal to, it's again proportional to the area times the change in or the temperature difference. But this time you're dividing by the length divided by the thermal, um, the thermal conductivity of the first material plus length of the second material divided by thermal conductivity of the second material. And so if the thermal conductivity of one material decreases, then this, uh, this term would increase and then the denominator would increase, so this would decrease.
And then if the length of this increases, then again, the denominator of this whole equation increases and this thermal uh, the rate of heat transfer decreases. But this is the equation that you can use to describe um, the rate of heat transfer throughout this whole entire um, material, or both materials from T1 to T2. And then so let's just say that um, the thermal conductivity divided by, or the length of material one divided by thermal conductivity, if this is greater in material one, then there is essentially more like you can think of thermal resistance in material one than material two. So whichever one has greater thermal resistance, there will be a greater temperature difference between its two ends so that the same amount of heat uh, flow can happen or the same rate of heat flow can happen because if something has a, a smaller uh, thermal conductivity or a longer length then you need a greater temperature difference in order to produce the same rate of heat transfer so if you have two materials end to end um, with different lengths and thermal conductivities but the same area this equation can describe the heat flow throughout both materials okay now we can uh, start um, start talking about how this works with the first law of thermodynamics. And first, we need to know how to calculate the work done by an ideal gas. So we're focusing on the work done by a gas now and not heat. So work is force times distance. Now consider you have a cylinder here, um, and then the cylinder has a plunger in it. So we have a cylinder with a plunger, and this is able to move up and down. Now there's going to be uh, an ideal gas here that's represented in the green area. Now we know that work is equal to force times distance, or the dot product of force and distance, so it's parallel. Now this green gas will exert a pressure on all sides of this um, or all sides of this container including the piston so it will exert a pressure outward and um, this force here on this piston is equal to so this is the force on the piston is equal to this uh, pressure times the area because force is equal to pressure times area in this case and then in this case it's negative because it is uh, going outwards and we'll see why this negative uh, appears later so we have work is equal to and this is work done on the gas so this is on the gas not by the gas so work done on the gas is equal to negative pressure times area times distance because if you're pushing down if this distance is going downwards we see that the force is opposite to the distance the force caused by the pressure of the gas is opposite to the distance which is why there's a negative sign here and then this can simplify into negative pressure times and then notice that this term here area times distance this is the volume of gas or the change in volume of the gas so finally we get that the work done on a gas is equal to the pressure times the change in volume of the gas. Now this is on the gas. So if um, this pressure times change in volume is positive, meaning that the final volume is greater than the initial volume, then there is negative work being done on the gas. And if this change in volume or is negative, meaning the, vol the gas gets compressed, there's positive work being done on the gas. And this makes sense because you can think that in order to compress the gas, you need to do work on it. And if the gas pushes out and expands, then it's doing work. And so the work done by a gas, so work by the gas, is just the opposite of this. So the, the work done by the gas is just equal to the pressure times the change in volume. Now, if we examine this on a PV diagram, which is just a graph that plots the pressure versus the volume for a gas, if we have a curve on this PV diagram uh, here, then notice that the area underneath this curve is just the magnitude of work. So this here is the magnitude of work. 
And then if we're looking at work done on a gas, uh, it depends on the direction of this um, PV diagram. But if the gas is being compressed here, like the volume is shrinking, then the work is the opposite of the air. So uh, if the volume is shrinking, then work is being done on the gas, which means that this area here um, is actually is going to be the area is negative and then if work is being done on a gas you t take a negative of that area which is positive so air the area is the magnitude and then again this is final minus initial so if the arrow is going from right to left here this would be the final state and this would be the initial so if we see final minus initial final is less than initial which means that this is negative the change in volume is negative but then the pressure here is always positive so we get a negative for this value and then you take the negative of that again and that gives you positive work done so whenever the volume compresses like this uh, the there is positive work being done on the gas and whenever the volume increases there's negative work being done on the gas so it is um, kind of the opposite of the area but then if you look at the work being done by the gas, it is the same as the area. So if you look at this, it's shrinking. And so there's negative work being done by the gas. And whenever it expands, so whenever this goes in the opposite direction here, the area is getting bigger. And so the change in volume is getting bigger. And this is positive work being done by the gas. So it is important to know that distinction between those. And another thing to notice is that pressure force is not conservative and that it de does depend on the path so let's just say on a pv diagram you start out at point a and point go to point b and you want to find out how much work a gas does so let's look at two processes here first the uh, pressure drops at a constant volume and then the volume inc increases at a constant pressure versus when you have a uh, constant or volume increase at a constant higher pressure and then a drop here so if we're going from point A to B both of these paths reach uh, go from point A to B but in this case the work done by the red path is going to be equal to this area underneath the graph and then the work being done by the blue path is equal to this whole area and so you can see clearly that the work done by the blue path is going to be greater than the work done by the red path or the magnitude of the work by the red path. And so again, this is work being done by the gas. Now, if it's on the gas, we can say that um, the magnitude or the magnitude is the, of the blue is going to be greater, but then it's going to be negative. Um, and so the work being done on the gas is negative here, but the work being done by the gas is positive. But we know that the magnitude is greater and they're not the same even though they arrive at the same location so you cannot assume that just because you start at point a and go to point b on the pv diagram that the work is the same now we get finally get into the first law of thermodynamics and that is that um, this is basically the conservation of energy and so we have the first law here uh, is that we have Q, which is heat, uh, and then plus W, which is the work on the system, is equal to the change in the internal energy of the system, which we will denote as delta U. Now, it is important to notice that these two refer to uh, energy transfers between a system and its environment so between system and environment it does not refer to any energy transfers within a system only energy that exits or leaves the system and interactions with the environment another thing to notice is here that this uh, energy change in energy internal energy or change in u is path independent so this is path independent. And what this means is that 
Um, so the internal energy of a system is a state function, which means at a certain, uh, with, if you're given a gas in a certain state, it will also have a certain amount of internal energy, just like it has, say, a certain amount of mass or pressure, like the pressure of the gas. It is something that you can uh, measure. And then if you go from one internal energy to another internal energy, this Q plus W here is always the same. So if you go from, let's just say, if you go from UI to UF, this Q plus W is always going to same no matter what path you take from UI to UF. Now you can go from UI to UF using only heating or using only work, but there's some, or even if you have positive heating, negative work or vice versa, it doesn't matter. As long as you go from one internal energy state to another internal energy state, the sum of these two always remain constant. And that, um, for that change in energy states, and that is uh, the conservation of energy and the first law of thermodynamics. Now, we can apply this first law of thermodynamics to a few thermodynamic processes. So let's start with um, adiabatic processes. So these can be either expansion or compression. Uh, so adiabatic. And this is, we can draw it on a PV diagram here. And, but this um, describes when um, Q is equal to zero. So there is no heat transfer between the environment and the system. Um, oh, and also, before I say that, I know, so I need to mention another thing is that um, the prop, the gases can all be described by the ideal gas law. So ideal gas law. Um, and that is that PV, so pressure times volume, is equal to N, which is number of moles of gas, times R, which is a constant, universal gas constant, and then T, which is the temperature in Kelvin of the gas. And so gases, ideal gases always follow this equation, no matter what type of process it is. However, when you have an adiabatic um, compression or expansion here, we have that heat is equal to zero, which means that all the change in energy from the system has to come from work. And this could be either because a process happens so fast, a thermodynamic process, that the system does not have enough time to transfer energy in or out of the system into the environment. Or it could be because the system is thermally isolated from the environment. Um, and so it is not able to transfer energy in or out. But basically, this happens whenever Q is equal to zero. And then it will follow a path that looks something like that. So um, we also have a process called um, isothermal processes, where temperature stays the same. And looking at the ideal gas law, you see that uh, if temperature stays the same, pressure and volume are going to be inversely related. And so that shows an inverse relationship here. So this is called isothermal, or in, it's perfectly inverse. So, so that means that PV is constant. However, in an adiabatic process, this is not the same curve as isothermal, which means the uh, gas changes temperature as its pressure volume changes. And so using the ideal gas law to describe this, we say that PV over T is equal to NR, which is constant. So PV over T is constant, but none of the variables uh, alone are constant throughout the process. So they all change, um, but they follow a curve that looks like this. That is not um, directly inverse. And so uh, given that Q is equal to zero, we can rewrite the first law of thermodynamics here as change in internal energy is equal to just work. And so the change in energy, the work is only because of work done on the gas. Um, now, some things to know is that for an adiabatic process, this can occur in uh, either direction. So you can either have expansion in where the volume increases or compression where volume decreases here. 
um, and the work done is just the area underneath this graph. So this is this here is going to be equal to the work. Now, again, things to notice here is that um, if volume, if the final volume is less than the initial volume in, in the adiabatic process here, if the final volume is less than the initial volume, meaning that it's a compression, so this is a compression, looking at this curve, you know that the final temperature has to be greater than the initial temperature. Because if you're going this way, uh, if you're going towards the, uh, the y-axis, per se, then you see that this goes up, so it cr it's steeper than an isothermal process, which means that um, the temperature increases with compressions. So if the gas is compressed, the temperature is increased. And if the gas expands, temperature decreases. In an adiabatic process, all right, next we can cover isochoric processes. So is this spelled isochoric? And then this is constant volume. So this doesn't mean that the volume at the start and the end are the same. It means that the volume stays constant throughout the entire process. And so if we look at a PV diagram here, so PV diagramming in an isochoric process, <coughs> isochoric process, volume stays constant throughout. So it could be like any of these lines. It's not all of these lines, it's just any of these. So it could be like this where it goes up and down, but the volume is constant and it could be at like any of these specified volumes. But like for any one process, it's going to just be one single line, vertical line on this graph. So one of these would be an isochoric process. And again, it's constant volume throughout the entire process. It's not just the start and the end um, are at the same volume. And so what this means is that, remember that work is equal to, work on the gas is equal to negative uh, pressure times change in volume. And so uh, if change in volume is zero here, constant volume, and work equals zero. So that means that the sec uh, first law of thermodynamics can simplify into just um, the change in internal energy is the amount of heat transferred. So um, looking at the ideal gas law, we have PV equals nRT, but since volume is constant and temperature can change in this, we can say P over T is equal to N R over V. And all of these here are constant. So this is constant. So N, R, and V are constant, which means that P over T is also is going to be constant. And that means that P1 over T1, so this is the pressure over the temperature at one point in the process, is going to be equal to pressure over temperature at another point in the process. And so you can use this um, proportion um, to find the relationship between different states. So if the pressure at one point, um, so if you start out at P1 and T1 and the pressure doubles, and then the temperature at that second point also has to double. And if you say I have a half decrease in pressure, the temperature also has to decrease by half in the second state of the system. So this is in... Uh, isochoric process and again this is constant volume throughout the entire process and it's represented by a vertical line on the PV diagram. Next we have um, isobaric processes. processes. So isobaric and this means constant pressure. So instead of a vertical line we have a horizontal line on the PV diagram. So this is pressure and volume. If the pressure is constant, then this is a horizontal line. So this can go in either direction. So either a compression or expansion. And this can be at any level of pressure. As long as it's a horizontal line, 
um, it's an isobaric process and this again is constant pressure throughout the entire process not just that it starts and ends at the same pressure now you see here that there is work done so let's just say for one of these here um, let's ignore the rest of these now if we go from point A to point B so let's just say we're having a compression here so this is point B and this is point A and then we go this way the work done here is going to be this um, and this area would be negative except the work done um, on a gas is the negative of the air so this is positive work done on a gas if we're uh, going on an isobaric pre process um, isobaric compression and so um, for an isobaric process we just have that there's constant pressure so pressure is constant and then we write the first law of thermodynamics as change internal change in internal energy is equal to heat plus work so there's nothing that we can cancel out here or set or reduce it's just that here we know that work is being done um and then if it's compression work is being done on the gas and if it is expansion then work is being done by the gas and then the sum of the work plus the heat is equal to the change in internal energy of the system and then so writing this out in the um, writing this out in terms of the ideal gas law we get that uh, since pressure is constant we have v over t so these both can volume and temperature can both change is equal to n r over p and so this is constant and what this means is that given any uh, state the volume over temperature is the same uh, so this proportion stays the same and so that means that if you have uh, one state so at state one volume one over temperature one um, this is going to be equal to volume two over temperature two so again volume and temperature are directly proportional in this you see um, and this means that if volume increases by like say volume doubles temperature also has to double and now remember this temperature is Kelvin and it's an absolute scale which means that you have to convert Celsius to Kelvin if you want to use these uh, proportions and same with the uh, isochoric process here you have to convert these to Kelvin or an absolute temperature scale in order to use these proportions uh, next we will go to the previously mentioned isothermal process so isothermal means uh, constant uh, temperature and now we will discuss this in more detail later but uh, if it's at constant temperature that means that there is no change in the internal energy of the system because temperature is directly related to the internal energy of the system so constant temperature and so first it's easier to look at the ideal gas law and then describe that so we have PV equals NRT. Now this is constant. This right hand side is constant because NRT are all held constant here. So that means pressure times volume is constant. And what does that mean? That means that P1V1 is equal to P2V2. And so that means, and also since this is constant, if pressure increases, um, if pressure increases, then volume has to decrease for this to remain constant. And if pressure decreases, volume has to increase for this value to remain constant. And that means that pressure and volume are inversely proportional. So pressure is inversely proportional to volume. And that gives us curves that looks like this. So it's an inverse curve here. Um, it's not perfectly drawn, but... And then there's multiple curves here. And then these all correspond to different temperatures. So if this is at like, let's just say this is uh, 100 Kelvin, and then this is 200 Kelvin, and then this is 300 Kelvin. Um, an isothermal process happening at 100 Kelvin has to follow this 100 Kelvin uh, inverse curve. And at 200 Kelvin has to follow this curve, and at 300 Kelvin has to follow this inverse curve. And notice that the 300 is higher than the 200 is higher than the 100 because at a constant volume if you increase temperature then pressure increases as well so the one at the higher um, pressure at a given volume is at a higher temperature and then there is work done being on the uh, by this process again and that's just the area of this is equal to work but since it's at a constant temperature 
we know that the change in energy here, change in internal energy is equal to zero, which means that we simplify the first law of thermodynamics down to Q plus W equals zero. And this is important because this implies that Q is equal to negative W. So the heat um, transferred into the system is equal to the energy of the work um, being done out of the system. And so these two are equal and uh, opposite, equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. So the net change in energy of the system is zero, and it follows one of these uh, inverse paths. And now, like I said, this adiabatic process, um, if you draw the adiabatic process on here, the curve will actually be more steep than one of these uh, isothermal curves. So this would be like adiabatic. And so you see that in adiabatic process, there's actually a change in temperature as you go with the compressions and expansions. And again, like the other processes, this can be either compression or expansion. So isothermal compression is where volume decreases, and isothermal expansion is where volume increases. Now we can go to uh, a last type of process uh, that's kind of special because nothing is being held constant throughout the process. Um, it's just that the start of the process is equal to the end of it. So when you have a cyclic process, so it goes in like a cycle here, where it returns to any point uh, multiple times. So it doesn't matter what point, let's just say like this point A, it goes and then it goes to like, let's just say point B here, and then it returns to point A, or it starts at point B and goes to A and returns to B. This is called a cyclic process. And since it returns to the same point, we know that the change in energy is equal to zero. Now that there's nothing constant during this whole process, or it doesn't, there don't have to be things that are constant. It's just that since the initial state is equal to the final state, we know that uh, the change in energy here is zero. However, does, this does not mean that no work is being done. In fact, if we look at the area here, we have the <coughs> area. First, we have this area here, um, which is work being done in one direction. And this is um, the this is going to be uh, negative work done on the gas because we see that this is positive area since it's expanding. But then um, the work is equal work done on the gas is equal to negative p times change in volume. So this is going to be uh, positive work being done by the gas and negative work being done on the gas. However, if we look at the work being done um, on the other end of the cycle here, it's this whole area. And then this yellow is the work done on the top half of the cycle. And if you notice here, this again is work being done on the gas. Um, and this would be positive since it's going, it's a compression. Um, and then, um, work done on the gas again is negative area. So if we look at the network here, it's the area inside of this cycle is network because everything out here cancels out. So we have network is the area inside of the cycle. The magnitude of network is equal to area inside cycle. And I will forgot to write this, but this is called a cyclic process. So it's a cycle, and then the area inside the cycle is the network. And we can see that um, if we look at the area and the net direction of this loop, if this loop is uh, counterclockwise, like the one I drew here, then we see that there's network being done on the gas. So that means that work being done on the gas is greater than zero. And since change in internal energy is zero, we know that the um, work being done uh, or the ener the heat uh, transfer of, of um, is going to be out of the system. So uh, from this, we know again, like the isothermal process, the first law of thermodynamics simplifies to change in u, which is equal to zero. So this is just zero equals work plus heat. So if work is greater than zero in a counterclockwise loop, then the heat has to be less than zero. And if this is a clockwise loop, clockwise loop here, um, if the loop is clockwise, we see that there is 
greater negative work being done because the top part of this, um, the top part of the loop is going to be negative work uh, if it's clockwise. Um, and then the bottom part is going to be positive. And so you'll see the negative area is greater than the positive area if it's clockwise. So if this is clockwise, then we know that the work is going to be less than zero and the heat is going to be greater than zero. And so the network, the direction of network um, for this cyclic process is going to be uh, determined by the direction of this loop. So if it goes counterclockwise, and this is on the gas, so on the gas. If it's counterclockwise, then there's network being done on the gas and the net heat transfer is negative. Whereas if it's clockwise, the network being done on the gas is negative and heat transfer is positive. Okay, now to a slightly different topic here, um, but that is related before, like I said, uh, thermal, so the energy of a gas particle is going to be directly related to its temperature. So let's look at the internal energy. Uh, internal energy uh, of gas of a gas here, or a system containing gas, an ideal gas. So internal energy of an ideal. So, and then in this case, we're assuming monatomic. So that means it's one particle. You don't have groups of particles traveling together. It's just all the gases are just randomly moving singular particles. Um, and then well, all the gas molecules are singularly moving gas particles. Uh, so an ideal monatomic gas. Um, we know that. So if we look at the kinetic energy per particle, per particle. So this is not the uh, internal energy of the whole system. This is just the kinetic energy of a single particle. Uh, we get the equation here. It's defined by K is equal to three halves times the Boltzmann constant times T. So again, this is per particle. And then here T is temperature in Kelvin. So this is uh, temperature in Kelvin. It ha again, this is important that it's an absolute scale. And then this is the average kinetic energy. So it's, here's so average, average kinetic energy per particle of gas, a monatomic gas is equal to three halves times K, uh, Boltzmann constant K times T. Now, what is the internal energy of a whole system? So like a collection of these gas particles? Well, uh, we want, given that we know the moles of gas, so N is equal to moles of gas so moles of gas so like a mole of gas um and then a mole of gas is equal to so avogadro's number particles and then we also know that boltzmann constant here is equal to the universal gas constant divided by avogadro's number um if we want to know the internal energy of a system given the that we know the moles of gas, we have the internal energy here is equal to, so the moles of gas times Avogadro's number, which gives the number of particles of gas times three halves Boltzmann constant times T. Now we know that Boltzmann constant is R divided by Avogadro's number. And we're multiplying by Avogadro's number again. So we get that the internal energy of a gas. Um, so this is a whole system of gas. This is not a simple particle. Um, this is a collection of particles or a system. Is equal to 3 halves n. And then this Avogadro's number times Boltzmann constant is just R, T. So this is the internal energy uh, internal energy of a system containing an ideal gas, consisting of an ideal gas. So internal energy, internal energy of system of ideal gas. Okay, uh, one more thing that we may find interesting is the kinetic, um, well, since we know the kinetic energy of a particle of gas, we can find the average speed of a particle of gas. 
So we uh, know that kinetic energy is equal to one half mv squared, and then this is also equal to three halves uh, Boltzmann constant times t. And now if we solve for this v, the speed here, we get v is equal to square root of uh, 3m Boltzmann constant times t. All right. So this, but then we usually don't know the mass of a single gas particle, but we could be given the molar mass or uh, molar mass or the um, mass in atomic mass units. And what this means is that uh, one AMU of um, this mass, one AMU times Avogadro's number of particles is equal to one gram. And so if we want to find the mass of the particle in kilograms, we find that the mass here is just simply equal to AMU divided by uh, Avogadro's number. So Avogadro's number here. And then we have to divide by a thousand again because this is in grams and we want it in kilograms. So in order to find the velocity of a gas particle, an ideal gas particle, we get that the velocity velocity here is equal to, average velocity again, is equal to three times the mass in AMU or the molar mass times um, Boltzmann constant times the temperature in Kelvin divided by 1000 times Avogadro's number. And so this is the velocity of a gas particle, um, an ideal gas particle, given its uh, mass in atomic mass units or its um, molar mass times, um, and then its temperature. So from this, we can see that the energy of a uh, gas, ideal gas, is directly proportional to the temperature, which means that as temperature increases, energy also increases by the same proportions. And then we can also see here that velocity of a gas is proportional to the square root of temperature, or the square of velocity is proportional to just the temperature of the gas. So in order to cause a um, in order to cause a two volt or like in order to double the average speed of a gas, you have to um, quadruple the temperature of the gas. And one more thing that we can see from this equation here is that nowhere does the mass of the gas appear. The energy of a gas is the same as long as the number of particles is the same and the temperature is the same. But then the velocity here or average speed does depend on the mass, which means that at the same temperature, two different gases or two different types of gas will have the same kinetic energy, but a heavier gas will be moving slower than a lighter gas because they have the same kinetic energy, but they have different masses. So their velocities must be different. Okay, that is a review of um, heat, uh, heat transfer conduction and the laws of thermodynamics and processes as well as energy of gas particles. Thank you.